Let's see. It says we're live. So let me go out to YouTube and see if it does indeed look like we're live. And I'll hit mute so I don't get that awful feedback that we had last night. <laughs> Hey, we are live. Let's see here. Hmm. You know, Paul, Paul that's, that's weird for some reason. I don't see you on the the YouTube chat for some reason. I only see a small um, insert picture bottom. Oh right. yeah, oh yeah. There you are. I just saw you. There you are. Gotcha, gotcha. It's it's working now. Okay, cool. <laughs> okay, let's get this over here and let me get the YouTube chat so I can see what they're asking us. We have two people watching <laughs> since we just started. <laughs> that's be that's better than none. <laughs> All right. Let me put this over here. Okay, Paul, are you ready? Okay. Okay, coming in three, two. Hey, Crawl Spacers, thank you for uh, joining in on this episode. It's a special one. It's our 500th episode, and I thought we'd celebrate by interviewing the original voice actor of Spider-Man, Paul. Paul Souls is on the line. Paul, thank you for talking to us. Thank you for having me, and I'm I, my congratulations on making it to 500. That's exactly what my back feels like. <laughs> You're you're performing nightly at Yuck Yucks also. <laughs> I like oh, <laughs> try oh, the I other things, but not Yuck Yucks. That's, that's dangerous. Yeah, that's no a, doubt. A very fancy profession. <laughs> yeah, they throw tomatoes at you if you're a bad comedian. You don't want that. Well, I've been doing a, a, a series just ready to release the uh, second season, mm -hmm. which is essentially an online um, show that's entirely improvised. Ah. So those chops are like what you'd almost have to do uh, at a second city, maybe not as yuck which is the stand up, <laughs> but that whole idea of uh, winging it, doing it as no doubt uh, you think it, um, it's uh, that's great challenge. It's nice to have a, a company of people who are really good at it, mm -hmm. and it's uh, very exciting to do. So I, I ha bet you had no idea 50 years later you would be in your living room talking to the world about a cartoon that you're voice acting. I mean, talk about, about this. Is the longevity of this show is amazing. 51. Yeah. Uh, you know, at my age, you feel that extra, especially <laughs> this time of the year when the air is, at least where I live, uh, raw with moisture and cold and everything else. So uh, a year is uh, not inconsequential. No, mm -hmm. I never thought. And I don't think uh, the lore is that Stan Lee would have uh, uh, was it was all that sure it was going to have these legs, and of course, since it was um, the bringing of the business for Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer Christmas special that brought <laughs> the teams to Toronto in time for our enterprise and scores that followed that uh, made this all happen. So no doubt. not unmindful of uh, what kind of a uh, train of events was unfolded by uh, the boys who did um, Rudolph, uh, what that uh, what that legacy has been. Now, before we heard your voice, we heard that amazing theme song by uh, Paul Francis Webster and composed by Bob Harris. When you first heard that song, what, what went through your mind? Did you think it'd be a standard for superhero songs from like the John Williams Superman theme? I mean, that is a, a classic superhero song. Well, it's, uh, it's nice of you to put it all in the same category as John Williams, who's <laughs> the, uh, you know, the, the man. About yeah. Things. But it is amazing, uh, the identity, the instant identity that the theme conjures up 
You don't have to say anything. You don't have to dress anything. You don't have to shave. You don't have to put on a costume. <laughs> you hear that music, and it's all there. It's a, it's an astonishing fact of the power of music and of mm -hmm. this form of it. Right. Were you were you in the recording studio when they did that, or or, no, or did you hear it on the first time on Saturday morning? More or less. Um, the same with the pictures. We we were never shown very much either in the way of animation or the characters often, uh, for certain of the major ones, of course, uh, you wanted to make sure that you captured what the intention of the artists were originally when they did the original uh, drawings. And there was consultation with the producers as what you're doing matching what their vision of it all was. Mm -hmm. But um, in terms of recording, we're, uh, you know, it's, uh, what's the analogy I'm trying to make? The less you know, the better it is. <laughs> uh, but, well, well, I don't know. Just keep that same analogy. You didn't know much because it was great. It was epic. It was a great well, song. It was pretty simple, and you just respond to what's going on. And I will apologize, but not too much, for saying that I had just become a father. Hmm. So the idea of having... Uh, almost an, uh, an immediate audience or someone um, young, as for example, for Rudolph, Hermie yeah, yeah. was, while he's an elf and a full grown elf, like uh, Attorney General Sessions. Um, <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> he, he is youthful. And yeah. I, I have a real bond. Nature provides and makes you ready to be a father, grandfather, and so forth. So uh, having him uh, there as part of the uh, tapestry of, of daily life yeah. was helpful in making the mind think what might appeal to the young. And we, I've been, like you said, your son wouldn't be possible. We wouldn't be able to do this broadcast without your son. So I imagine it must be cool to be uh, a kid's father. Then you're also Spider-Man. I mean, that must be the coolest thing as a dad. Say, yeah, you know, I'm Spider-Man kid. <laughs> well, if I had been, if we had arranged a contract and got more money from it, then I'd say all, all sure. But that was not to be because those were the terms they came here. A good pool of actors yeah. that work cheap. Yeah. Up in Toronto, right? Where you're from? Is that right? Yeah. Are you still in Canada or are you in the United States now? No, no, I'm in Toronto. You're on Toronto. Yeah. St still your home. Awesome. I spent a few months here and there in the around the world, uh, but Toronto and uh, Ontario, Canada have always been my home. And it's if asked, you know, is there any other place on earth? And I've been to a few places, thankfully, mm -hmm. uh, at somebody else's expense. <laughs> uh, the experience, um, yeah, the richness of of uh, other nationalities and cultures, but I can't think of another place I'd rather live. Although I've enjoyed it. I spent a year in Germany with the Canadian Air Force yeah. as a civilian, although I was in the auxiliary. Uh, I've lived in uh, L.A. and New York, I toured in New York State for a couple of years. Yeah. So, so Dallas, be Texas. Be before we move off of the theme song, it, it we were talking about the longevity of the song. It's been honored in every Spider-Man movie. In the Tobey Maguire, we had the, the street violinist play play it and sing it. In Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man, it was his ringtone on his cell phone. Mm -hmm. And in Spider-Man Homecoming, it was in a big orchestra was playing it for the opening title scenes. Mm -hmm. I mean, what what is that like? I mean, have you seen all the Spider-Man movies? And, and, and does that just... Big, bring a big smile to your face when you see that homage or honoring. I, I, it, the only re reply I can give you is that I've experienced that kind of identity and excite, excitement when a theme or a big orchestra plays something that, um, that's that, uh, what's the right word? Uh, uh, I, won't, I don't want to say inspiring, I mean, it mm -hmm. stimulates the whole history. Uh, an existence of the genre of comic books, of comic characters, of of heroes and superheroes, and uh, and all that that implies, including the fact that uh, it took me about forty years or forty five years 
to kind of figure out what Stan Lee had in mind in creating this character because uh, the idea of a, a, a superhero who was a kind of a scrawny teenager, uh, kind of a bit of a uh, science guy, not a, a studly uh, football player, yeah. had trouble yeah. getting along or finding girls, uh, you know, all these things. Uh, uh, finally, it finally occurred to me that what Stan had in mind to play, because I was having trouble. I don't see myself as any superhero. I'm not, not a big athletic person. Uh, but uh, what I did understand is he had created a guy people could identify with who aren't all that gifted physically or mentally or whatever, but are dedicated and inspired by the fate of his uncle, caring for his aunt, uh, the sense of justice, um, and he would do what he can uh, with the assistance of uh, the spider bike. As an actor, that must be nice to have an average Joe. I mean, a, a guy that you can relate to, right? Well, as I say, it took me a very long time to kind of get uh, relax in the idea that I didn't have to be sounding like um, a superhero with muscle upon muscle upon muscle, the ability to fly, the ability to charm, the ability to do all sorts of supernatural things or extraordinary things. Then, as an as an actor, is that harder to just be normal? Well, I'm, that's a good question. And the way you phrased it, it, it every actor arrives at his solution or her solution to um, how to render the character they have in front of them. What what you want to do is be as honest to the intention of the creator, the writer, uh, as mm -hmm. possible. And in this case, understanding that. This was an ordinary kid trying to do extraordinary things for a very good reason mm -hmm. that made it easy to do. Right. And I mentioned some of the other actors that have been Spider-Man. You were the first, but have you met any other Spider-Man actors or voice actors over the years? Not really. Uh, the yeah. company that uh, was already here in Toronto that um, Stan and Marvel and... Uh, the Rudolph people found was a well-established acting community in the English language with cultural ties to both Britain and the US by geography, by culture, uh, daily institutions and so forth. Gotcha. So let's talk a bit about your origin story. We've heard Spider-Man's over and over. Uh, did you pick up any Superman or Batman comic books back in the day when you were a kid? I think I was a pretty typical kid uh, you know my youth was during the second world war uh and i was pretty much aware of what was going on right from the beginning of it to the end and, and the aftermath so those were formidable forces and formative forces as well so my heroes if you like besides the usual kids comic book heroes and the, the only ones I recalled there being at that time was Superman, which was created partly by a Tor Torontonian, um, Joe, um, uh, Oh, Joe Schuster. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I remember Aquaman. I can remember, uh, who was it? Shazam, Captain America. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, used, I used to get my trash can lid and pretend I was Captain America all the time but, out in the front yard. I imagine you probably did too. <laughs> yeah. So besides that regular uh, thrall of comic books, we also had the real life inspiration of men that we'd known, teachers and relatives, mm -hmm. who had gone off to fight the Second World War. So my real heroes were pilots. Yeah. I Islands were the Battle of Britain, 1939, 40, 41. Uh, the bomber pilots, uh, the major Allied airplane that uh, wasn't American was the Avro Lancaster. That was made in Canada, partly. Mm -hmm. I mean, many of them were made in Canada as well as England. So, and the CBC, our Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, which was a government operate, operation, but our, our first national uh cultural institution that spanned the country 
kept us uh, unified, had a program called L for Lanky. And it was mm -hmm. a story of one Lancaster bomber crew. So these were the guys who were yeah. my, my superheroes, if you like, because they were doing it daily and often not surviving. Yeah. That, was, yeah. that was made clear to us. I'll tell you a quick, quick anecdote. I, I mean no nastiness, but I can see him today. Mm -hmm. was a math teacher we had in early high school named Mr. Tuck, who stood well over four feet five, I guess, and a um, uh, nasty, unhappy man who had been a veteran of the First World War. Uh, and he, would, he was in charge of the health class at the school. So he would show up once a week at this health class, and here we were, what, 25, 30 teenage pubescent kids with pimples and starting to you know develop and he'd start his lecture whatever the subject was and wind up getting himself into a knot about how we were sitting here in toronto living off the fat of the land where the real men were overseas fighting and dying mm. boy did that ever make us feel good yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah no doubt. That, that was an early introduction to the to both the uh, uh, sex classes and health and um and heroism. I mean, yeah. it was pretty intimidating. No doubt. Well, and in, in doing the research, and you you mentioned it a little bit earlier, I'm amazed how much that Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer uh, special feeds into the Spider-Man show. I mean, this this was the beginning of forming the Spider-Man show. You had a lot of similar actors, the, the company right. you said, right? That's right. That's so right. How, how did the Rudolph special come about for you? Well, for me, it came first. And for mm -hmm. this whole business of cartoon voicing in Toronto, it uh, it came first. And it was because these two producers from NBC had heard that there was this excellent company of English speaking radio actors in Toronto and that we could that we worked very cheap, except for Burl Ives. He was the only one that made any money. <laughs> Still does to this day, his estate. And uh, uh, the the producers uh, knew that they had a good thing going. And then when the word got out, there was this pool here, uh, so economically favorable in these conditions and capable, the whole business kind of just kept on going and expanding. So we're, we're very lucky. And it was nice to ha have had the approval of uh, as uh, uh, great an authority as Orson Welles, who knew you know, arguably as great a, a voice actor as ever lived, yep. and actor and producer uh, and cultural force at that time. He knew how broad and good the acting companies were in Toronto, and that helped uh, the industry continue. And you're, if anybody didn't know, you're the voice of Hermie, the, the little elf that wanted to be a dentist. Talk and a bit yeah. about Hermie. How did you go about voicing Hermie? Well, all my life I've had trouble with dentists. I hate them. I mean, I don't hate them. One of my best friends, as a matter of fact, until his passing, was my dentist. But I, I've had pain with dentists since I was 13. Eventually, today, I'm not going to show you because I don't want to embarrass <laughs> anybody else. But I have a full set of uh, replacement teeth, and I'm much happier because I don't have to worry about cavities and uh, extractions and when when you're in a when you're in a dentist chair do you say hey you know i'm hermy the, the little elf that wants to be the dentist do you ever tell that to your doc no no <laughs> it has a nerve. you know you don't fool around with a guy who's mucking about in your mouth you don't want to <laughs> say it one way or another uh yeah, no doubt. Happens, you have to say please be careful doctor because i'm an absolute chicken here and don't 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 make me cry but i i had many the days of pain. In fact, I, I sound silly. When I was a, a late teenager, early 20s, your wisdom teeth start giving you trouble. Same here. Same here. Everybody. I think. So I'd had two out. I didn't much like it. And the only anesthetic they had at the time was ether, which can make you very nauseous. <laughs> uh, so I wasn't much fond of it. The time I so I uh, I don't know a month or so after the first pair were taken out, it was time for the second, and I went into the dentist and I I can still see the office, and I said, Doctor, please no, 
whatever you do, don't not do much of ether. Please, I hate it. It makes me ill. He says, no, no, we're not using ether. Puts the mask on my faith, and it's ether. So in a stupid fit of temper, I, I inhaled extra heavy, which was the dumbest thing to do because it made me nauseous. Uh, and, and it liquefied, burned a hole in my tongue. Ooh. But, but that was because I was, my temper got in the way. But uh, I, I hated that. When, Man, when, that does not sound like a good dental experience for a guy that wanted to be the dentist, you know? No, no. <laughs> but I, what I did understand, and if I'm, I hope I'm not uh, stretching or forcing the issue, but uh, there was a lot in common, the heroes and the ethos of the morality of both those shows. These were not extraordinary superhero people. They had ordinary dilemmas that uh, motivated them. They wanted justice. They wanted a sense of belonging. Hermie, the, the dentist, and Rudolph bonded because they were outcasts. Yeah. No one wanted them. And who hasn't gone through life either not being wanted on the baseball team or the football team or the basketball team or whatever? you weren't quite good enough pick me pick me but you never are all of that feeling of not getting getting along or going along or being included we've all been excluded one way or another that was common i think to both these characters and i think part of the reason why the shows and their existence appeal to people because we've all been there right exactly we, we can relate to these humanized characters that are written yeah. Um, the voice of Hermie, uh, I, if you would have told me when I was a kid, Hermie and Peter Parker, Spider-Man were the same actor. I wouldn't have believed you. Really? Talk, talk about the voice of Hermie. How did you get, get that high pitched voice for him? Well, again, that was, uh, uh, partly the effect of Jonathan, uh, my son, uh, elves are small people, right? Yeah. They're shorter than most. And, and, it, and it's a fact of anatomy. That the smaller your larynx is, the higher in pitch, higher in pitch. So automatically you, your voice goes up, and uh, elements of <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> pardon me, elements of youth, uh, innocence, are all part of the character. So right. I all I had to do was take a look at that uh, first. Um, uh, drawing that we were shown with the blonde curly hair and the wide eyes and his willingness to want to do something beyond making toys mm -hmm. uh be useful uh, was very appealing and that's uh, how it, it came about <laughs> i still hear it i still hear it you still got him well it, it it's a matter of you're getting paid to be a kid or to be small or to be youthful or innocent that's all that's that's wonderfully restorative you you took the the octave down a bit for peter parker well there was i i even as a kid i thought there was two voice actors for spider-man but it was you because you threw the voice of spider-man you made it a lot deeper and peter parker was a little bit a little bit more hermy he was a little bit upper register i guess well he was youth he, you know he was a teenager essentially mm -hmm. and uh not all of our anatomy is developed when you're a teenager. So <laughs> voice is naturally going to be, you know, when we, we mark our passage from adolescence when our voice drops, right? Yes. Yeah. Physical measures. Um, and uh, the same with these characters. Uh, the higher pitch, the more youthful. Um, Parker was really an adolescent. Uh, trying to become a good photographer, and he was running afoul of J. Jonah Jameson, who was constantly berating him and yelling at him, and nobody <laughs> likes to get bullied like that. So You could have done the voice actor of J. Jonah, but they, the other actor that did it was so epic. I always hear that voice in my head. Paul Klegman, he yes. and looked like a real, not a bully, but a, the kind of a boss that uh, pushes people around, commands authority. Well, he that voice also was uh, Rudolph's dad, Donner. So yeah. he he played your boss in Spider Man, and he played your dad in Rudolph. 
<laughs> well, that's because this acting company that yep. uh, my first cousin Bernard Cowan created that uh, that did the voices for uh, Rudolph and Spider Man. He these were all people he'd worked with actors in Toronto from who'd originally come from all parts of the country. Paul from Paul Kligman from Winnipeg and uh, others from all over that um, made this acting company. So we all bonded pretty well. And in the history of the eight or 10 years after the mid 60s, when all this was happening, some of us would be heroes. Some of us would be uh, supporting players. I don't know how many times I've been a bank manager or a professor or a cop or something in you know support of somebody else who's the lead. What's uh, what's your weirdest gig you ever voiced? The weirdest character that was like a supporting character or something? No, they weren't that big. So okay, <laughs> of, of any of them being particularly um, uh, memorable. Yeah, uh, just the idea that you you could you'd show up for work and you never knew who the, who you were going to be, and that was. Uh, Stimulating. It was also the fun of, of if you like, being a comic book character where it's all for joy. It there's, no, there's nothing serious about it. It's all fun. It's all playing. So you you look in the studio, and here are grown men <laughs> writhing on the floor, making great arm gestures, leering at each other, sort of acting out uh, these extraordinary um, actions of essentially young people or heroes that are far from normal. So it was an attempt to literally live a fantasy. Back to that changing of the voice. Uh, George Reeves did it as Clark Kent, Superman. Uh, even Christian Bale did it when he was Bruce Wayne and Batman. Ooh. You you also did a different version of Spider-Man. and I mean, Peter Parker and Spider-Man. Talk about doing the the more the confident spider-man versus the more timid teenager well that was if you like early on not easily done because I, I don't picture myself as a superhero so i can only kind of assume in my mind what kind of serious tone a, a superhero would put and as i said earlier i think this is what stan lee had in mind uh, and I eventually was just doing it naturally, attempting to sound like a hero without being one. Mm -hmm. so you try to make yourself sound as though you're authoritative, capable, physically able, etc. But mostly what's driving you is a sense of justice, wanting to get the right thing done, protecting people, trying to do some good. Right. Do you, do you still have the Spider-Man voice in you that you, you could, I know you pulled out Hermie a little bit. I think unfortunately my 87 year old chords, vocal chords, uh, a little too raspy for me to sound, uh, you know, like a superhero. I heard it. I heard it. <laughs> That's still there. It's easier to do the, uh, the younger voices, you know, like Hermie or, uh, other professions, mm -hmm. but um, if uh, Peter Parker, I could, you know, all I have to think of is is uh, the bully, if you like, Mr. Uh, Jameson. Gosh, Mr. Jameson, you shouldn't be yelling at me. I'm just a young photographer trying to get along. That's awesome. That's awesome. Going back to the history of it, you you wrapped up the uh, the Rudolph show. And then Marvel, I guess, came came to you with the superheroes, uh, the the short superhero shows, and you voiced also another one of my favorite characters, Bruce Banner, and the, as the Hulk, right? Well, unfortunately, I don't know why we're never able to get to IMDb or whatever. And correct. Oh, is that that not correct? You didn't do it, Bruce correct. Banner. No, I didn't do Bruce Banner. That was a wonderful and original, one of the most original radio characters I've ever heard. His name is Max Ferguson. Okay. okay. He used to have the most inventive early morning show uh, where he would take the morning's newspapers, make up uh, sketches uh, of real and fictitious people, and do a kind of political commentary uh, in these little dramas every morning. It was brilliant. I don't know anybody to, even around today who can do that. And you know the size of the staffs <coughs> of shows like. Yeah uh jimmy kimmel or um 
Uh, Jimmy got, Fallon, the Jimmys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I can, Jonathan has given me here a picture. I don't know if it can be seen. I can see it. Yeah. The, um, yeah, the, I, I'm holding it, trying to get it close to the camera. Yeah, I can see uh, it. The guy in the white uh, sweater, that's Max. Okay. We used to do a character called Rawhide. Uh, and um, beside it Paul Kligman looking menacing. Okay. Well, Very, cool. That, right? Very cool. That's neat. Was that the recording studio where he recorded Spider Man? Yes. Okay. Very well, cool. We, in Toronto. Uh, yeah. yeah. Spider Man was done pretty much at a place called Eastern Sound, mm -hmm. which was the go to studio in Toronto for music, voice, commercials, all sorts of things. Ever small groups. Uh, people like. Um, Help me here. Gord Lightfoot would record there. Oh. Lots of other names. Neat. Yeah. Here's the control room of it. Oh, very cool. Pretty ordinary. So studio. talk about talk about that recording. So there's there's obviously a director probably where that guy was sitting at the soundboard. Right. Are all the actors in the studio? Are you are you seeing each other in the face as you're you're recording? Yeah. Yeah. Back, those were back in the days when we did everything in sequence and everybody was in the studio. Um, here's a, a group shot, sort of. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah, that looks great. Tell me who we're seeing in those pictures. Well, I can. I'm looking at the back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not a superhero, you know. <laughs> I just play one on TV. <laughs> uh, well, uh, there's Max, myself, I think, and Paul. And the larger face in the foreground is Bernard Cowan. He's the guy who got us all together and organized it and did the casting. And which one are you? What, real quick on that one. Which one are you? Point to the one you are. Well, if I if it is me, it'd be this one. Okay. <laughs> That's cool. That's, That's very cool. So, um, I, that best must be cool to have all those voice actors in one room playing off of each other. That just must be more of a party than a job, you know? It was, and, and it's more like a kindergarten. Came <laughs> <laughs> into the studio and saw us writhing around, acting out, etc like a, a six-year-old, a seven-year-old, a three-year-old, you'd wonder what the heck is going on. Right. That's there we were. So how did you land the role? I mean, had you heard of Spider-Man before this gig that you got? Well, I had not. And I have to admit that was more good luck than good management. Uh, Buddy Cowan had this group of people he knew. And really the biggest, the biggest um, trait you had to have in order to qualify was the ability to work fast. There you go. Content is king, right? Well, you, studio time is king. <laughs> but one of the people in this series, arguably as great an announcing voice as ever existed, did three out of the five commercials during the week of everything in Canada, Henry Raymer, uh, was so good uh, and quick that when he was booked for a studio gig, the union re requires that you get there 10 minutes before your job starts. Mm -hmm. Henry, to the second, arrived 10 minutes late. And the reason he got away with it was because he never ran overtime, never took the, uh, you know, made, made problems for the producers. So he was saving them money in essence. And that's how he could get away with that little quirk. Did you ever have any unique visitors come to the studio? Like did Stan Lee and Steve Ditko ever stop by and see what you guys were doing? No, but a few years after all of this, in the uh, early 80s, July of 1980, I did a program called Beyond Reason, in which famous, a couple of famous people would appear in front of three, I don't know what you'd call them, paranormal Specialists, a, car, a, a tarot reader, a, a, sorry, a palm reader. Uh -huh. all, all these disciplines were, you know, uh, uh, the attempt to divine your identity, abilities, etc., from these paranormal sorts of influences. And Stan Lee was booked on one of these shows. <laughs> so it was Victor Borga, so were some. Uh, Julie Newmar, I think. Uh, yeah, Catwoman. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. That same show. 
you can, Jonathan is reminding me that video of that show is available what online? I think on, it's on YouTube, right? Yeah, well, yeah. CBC, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Nice. They're re loosening up some of their archives, releasing, uh, even though it was not known how much of these things were kept, but some still exist. So you were on the same show Stan was on? Is that what you were saying? Yeah, I okay. was the host. He was the was that your first time you met him? Yes. That, that ought to be interesting. Hi, I'm the voice of Spider-Man. Nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah, he was not, uh, you know, regularly in the studio. Uh, very few of the producers usually were. We never saw Burr alive for Rudolph. Hmm. He was always in New York. We were in Toronto. He was counting his money, it sounds like. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the family still is. Yep. So that first day of recording, do you have some fun memories about the first few days of recording for the Spider-Man show? Interesting question, my boy. I, I, the first days, no. Uh, yep. You know, we'd uh, when we'd come in, saw what the job was. It was then a matter of showing up for the recordings and having to do them, as I said earlier, uh, fairly quickly. Time is money. Was, right. The uh, rental of a studio was expensive. So um, your ability to get, get it done quickly and the producer, the director, had to work. Uh, you know, we didn't have... Um, motion picture or whatever played in front of us that we match we had to record to the discipline of x number of frames of film per second 24 mm -hmm. frames per second so this line in if you like a certain line had to be done in 1.8 seconds or something or 48 45 frames that would drive you nuts, I would imagine. <laughs> well, it was a, it was a it was kind of a skill you kind of got used to, like you know, you know the range of your arms when they're out and so forth. But that was the discipline you were hired for, and you got used to, and it was easy. But then the writing was good enough that you you didn't have to you know do any special surgery to get those lines in in the correct amount of time. Now you said you had the company in front of you. Uh, did you read the script? from front to back and then do several episodes at a time or did you all read specific lines together several episodes i don't know we would go in most of us had day jobs you know oh yeah <laughs> and uh so this was like fun and maybe a couple of times a month three times a month scripts would arrive and you'd work over two or three days and uh get four or five done a day uh it wasn't all that much dialogue. You check those cartoons out. There isn't all that much. Well, he's he swung he swung through the city a lot, so yeah. that canceled some of the dialogue out. That's, that's, yeah, but you you probably had the most dialogue of anybody. Is there any lines? I mean, obviously the Wallop and Web Snappers is my favorite, which is also well, the name yeah. of your website. Um, yeah, I'm glad to hear you say that. That is the reason for the name, but it's also it's unique because it was only in the cartoon series. It was never in the comic book. Mm hmm that's true any other any other lines that you, are some of your favorites that uh that stick out just the gosh mr jameson you shouldn't yell at me <laughs> I'm, I'm very sensitive and suck my thumb a lot and it don't i don't like to be yelled at <laughs> uh, so we we mentioned one actor another one uh that you worked with closely peg dixon she uh was everything from your love interest betty brant uh also your aunt may which is kind of odd but <laughs> she was also in rudolph she she was your mom she was mrs donner and mrs santa claus and she even voiced mary jane who was a, a go-go dancer and the niece of captain stacy in that cartoon so what was it like working with peg I can't remember. No, I, <laughs> you've got this down incredibly. Um, remember, we're talking 51 years ago. Right. Uh, and while there are very few shows I've done in my life that I have forgotten, um, I've done enough that uh, it's not easy to kind of restage hours and hours and hours of it. But this is a company of people who could do this work and do it fast. And thus you were, like all good acting companies, very dependent on the strengths, 
speed, abilities of others. And Peg had one of those magnificent varieties of capabilities uh, that distinguished her. May I also say, meaning no, uh, taking nothing away from Peg, mm -hmm. you know who voiced Rudolph. You, one more time, you don't know who voiced Rudolph? Do you know who voiced Rudolph? I don't know who voiced Rudolph. Well, this is the story, if you like. Okay. The person who did Rudolph was a middle-aged lady who stood four feet three years. Seriously. Very wow. lady named Billy May Richards. Okay. Billy May was active in a troop show during the Second World War for the Navy. Hmm. Uh, and she did the best little boy voice at the CBC. Oh, that's she, cool. She was Rudolph. Uh, oh. Magnificent. Did she ever come over to the Spider-Man show and do any voice acting? Not in Well, she may have. Yeah. But mostly it was Rudolph. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Um Mary, they they changed Mary Jane a little bit for the '60s cartoon. I think she was only in one episode. She was a go-go dancer, and she was Captain Stacy's daughter. I mean, Betty Brant was mainly your love interest as Jonah's secretary. Right, and I'm really embarrassed that I'm not, you know, that familiar by by any means as you are. <laughs> I'm delighted, but uh, I there's an awful lot of stuff to retain. And yeah. If anybody would have ever accused me of uh, being the most facile line learner in history. Right. So tell me about that first Saturday morning. The Spider-Man show is on ABC. Did you gather around the, the television and watch it? Or did you have friends over? What, how, how did you celebrate? Or did you? was it just another Saturday? I'm afraid. I hope it isn't disappointing to people. <laughs> it was just another Saturday. Yeah. It wasn't the only thing in my life. Yeah. For the rest of us, uh, there was lots of drama going on at CBC, uh, formal, everything from Shakespeare classics to contemporary. Remember the CBC radio in a country with six and a half time zones, 6,000 miles across, um, where people are, you know, the next person is maybe 100 miles away. Well, not quite, but. Uh, mm -hmm three or four or five or eight million people in a country that big, second largest landmass in the country, in the world. Um, what are they going to say? Uh, the, a, lot of, a lot of people. Canada. CBC, yeah. CBC, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, was our national theater, news organization, entertainment source, political source, um, opinion, uh, it, it was, it was a national, I'm going to say treasure organization, um, but it was our, among other things, our national theater. Mm -hmm. So doing all this drama was, um, uh, what in essence kept the country together. You, the United States had the film industry, pioneered the uh, radio networks. A good drama, but the CBC was a one-stop shop for almost everything cultural in our country. It was no, the no. only outfit that could afford it, uh, and 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 it still serves that function right. somewhat today. But just to put a button on this, uh -huh. my uh, good fortune was that my day job was one of those CBC mandated public affairs programs that covered everything. And it's why I got to travel so much around the world. It was a daily, it was a daily daytime show that worked on the premise that women who were maybe home raising a family during the day and watching television and taking care of kids, domestic affairs, that they have a brain too. And it wasn't just quiz shows and soap operas. Mm -hmm. so the CBC ran this current affairs program. And I was so you were you were an actor, a voice actor, and a newsman, right? Awesome, very nice. A co-host on that show for uh, sixteen years. What's your favorite? What of uh, those three professions? What did you like the most? Well, oh, I couldn't couldn't pick one. I wouldn't. 
Yeah. There, it's like picking your kids. Which one do you like the best? Yeah, I, I like yeah. them all together. No, so very, the, very grateful to have been able to operate on all those levels. Now we were talking a bit about how the production company they they were tight with the money and the budget. Uh, they were so tight they didn't even draw the lines on Spider-Man's chest. <laughs> they were uh, tight. So uh, they reuse that stock footage uh, of Spider-Man swinging through the city. Yeah. And I, I read that they, I had never heard of Rocket Robin Hood, but they used some footage from that cartoon too. Yeah. Sure. I, I mean, is, is there a reason? I mean, they, the, I guess they, they, the first production company, if I understood right, went out of business. Is that right? And then they took it over for season two and three. The history, all these changes of directors and, and, and often artists are better known by people like you and my son who can yeah. tell whose artistry does this yeah. and who, whose didn't. Uh, we were involved with the the voice work, and that was, uh, you know, in that. Yeah, yeah no doubt. Um, talk about your favorite episodes, some that stand out for time. I know it's been 51 years, but uh, do you have, like, I just watched the origin story today, this morning, and that was pretty faithful to the comic book. It was. The with the exception of the two guys in the car yeah. wanting the, the Peter to get in to be the third guy for the girl. <laughs> that was yeah. a little bit different, calling him a bookworm, but uh, the very faithful adaption, I thought. Well, the right. And it also states for all time, if you like, the essential purpose and the reason why Spidey became Spidey and Peter became Spidey to write a terribly observed wrong you know he spent his life feeling guilty about having let these thugs get away and mm -hmm. wreak havoc in his family and the world so that was his motivation if you like right. and uh i think it was classic in, in the way uh, uh stan and his writers conceived these origins the myth origins of these characters Right. They were substantial, honest, dependable, believable, and universal. And that's mm -hmm. what makes a great story endure. And I really think, you know, the comic book was popular, but it was your show that really fed it to the masses. I mean, people in 1967 hadn't heard of Spider-Man outside of the, the comic book spinner rack. I mean, you are your, you and your show is an essential aspect of the love that we've had for this character for 50 plus years. I mean, well, it's good of you to say, but I have to observe that um, more good luck than good management was at work here, that these technologies came along at that time. I mean, I'm even today, in many areas of the business, um, the classic line I have to use because of technology changing and improving is how many times do I have to buy the white album? <laughs> if you're a Beatles fan, every format, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> You've got to keep buying new machines to play yeah. back the same thing. Exactly. Uh, I mean, I've seen in the last couple or three years. Uh, an, an, an increase in efficiency, size, shape, form of movie cameras to make shows. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no film anymore. I think there's almost no tape anymore. It's your, all your, your cell phone can pick, take better picture than some cameras. It's, these it's days. All nope. the size of one of these things. Exactly. Nothing. Speak, speaking of rebuying the same format, when I was a kid, I had a couple VHS tapes of the 60s show. And I rebought the box set yeah, here right. <laughs> with the insert by Stan Lee and everything oh, like right, that. Right, right. So, um, I, by the way, this is out of print. I wish Disney would put these back in print, you know, the, the I DVD, the blu I, I would agree with you. And, I, you know, my son and I have, over the last year, been to two or three or four Comic-Cons. And uh, it's very exciting uh, when people come up with that box set and ask for an autograph. I did a show about five years ago for, hard to remember anymore, called Less Than Kind. Mm -hmm. In Winnipeg, we shot it with a wonderful actor, lead actor named Maury Chaikin. Chubby, great big fella. Do you remember Dances with Wolves? Yeah, band? yeah, with Kevin Costner. Yeah, it's a good movie. And at the beginning, Kevin, or his character, 
comes to this army outpost post and is outfitted to go out and take over this old abandoned fort, right? Yeah. Well, he gets his orders from a rather chubby colonel, uh, rather disdainful, gives him his order and shoots himself. Do you remember that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's Rory Chagan. Wonderful. Oh, okay. And this was a comedy. We shot it in Winnipeg. Um, I brought this up for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry i get off track every now and then too don't worry no i'm, I'm sorry because it was a, uh, an important point to be made maybe it'll come to me okay oh. um what one other thing we were what favorite episodes i'm not sure you ever said what, what's some of the ones that stand out in your memory that you enjoyed doing or acting or how they came out i wish i wish i could tell you and it's not a matter of sparing somebody else's feelings if you like one more than than the other. It's just, uh, I've done several series, including one of stories of history, Professor Kitzel and his magic machine. Uh, there's been so much, mm -hmm. and I've been lucky enough to be involved in so many different plays that to remember one above others yeah. is a little hard. The, um, the, this was, I'm getting a, a prompt here from my dear son. Oh, okay. Yeah. Here, comes trouble. here comes trouble, he says. Okay, that's one of your faves? I guess. <laughs> I'm sorry if I, if I can't remember more specifically. It's okay. The um, Another thing, it, it started... If, if oh, I know why I brought up Les and Kai. Oh, okay, very, go ahead. Go ahead. The dance well, is with the well, well, actor. I know this is very self-serving, but it's a, it's a fact. But it speaks to your point. Mm -hmm. When we were doing Less Than Kind out in Winnipeg, uh, and we were shooting, it was a, a shot on video, several of the crew members would, and we're talking of distances between New York and Chicago, let's say. That's how, how, how far away uh, Winnipeg is from Toronto. So it's a, it's a big, big, big space. Anyway, these, these, some of these crew members would come up with that same box set that you just showed me. Yeah. And ask for an autograph. And did, yeah, those. Mm -hmm. That ever make me feel good. <laughs> like a rock star. I say you kind of got a little immortality. But well, what is this? I, I, I Correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you've you re just recently started going to comic book conventions? I mean, I would yes. think you'd be a rock star at them. For only two years, less than two years. What is that like to see so many people love you and your work? Well, of course, I think it's absolutely deserved. No, I, <laughs> you know, I mean, one doesn't realize the um, the legs, the legacy, the connection. But I have to uh, say, with with absolute conviction, the reason is the rock solid, universal appeal of the stories. Mm -hmm. Youth in Rudolph, two kids who've been rejected, young people, you'd say, mm -hmm. by others, their peers. They don't fit in. They have no place. They have no sense of being accepted or belonging. And everybody's experienced something like that, and that bonded them. And here is Spidey, who was a victim, if you like, of modern urban circumstance, suffered loss. Uh, and a feeling of of inadequacy that he wasn't able to prevent the terrible fate of his his own relatives. I mean, imagine anybody. Imagine how difficult that is to live with. Right. And, and an absolute pure motivation. So these storytellers got it right in creating uh, characters who represent so much that's universal. Right. Now, also uh, in. 2008 you were in the incredible hulk movie you were the you played stanley the uh the restaurant owner pizza place owner yeah yeah what well, how did that role come about i think that was so cool to see you in there that came about by a great act of courtesy and kindness from edward norton oh we had done a film called the score a few years earlier up in montreal that's where we met right we hit it off pretty well Frank Oz was the director of that. Marlon Brando was in it, and uh, you're, you're uh, dropping some names. <laughs> That's so I never, I never met Brando, and I never met Robert De Niro. But oh. <laughs> all my work with, with Me meeting Frank Oz is cool enough. That's Miss Piggy. Absolutely, 
Yeah. And there's a scene in the score up in an electrical kind of uh, room in this uh, museum in Montreal, which is the repository of these very, very valuable antiquities. And uh, uh, Norton, who's, you know, at the base of one of the evildoers, uh, discovers me, because I'm a superintendent of this uh, building, he discovers me in this electrical room, and the scene calls for him to grab me by the throat and bash me at wire mesh fence or wall. And Edward is a, I won't call him a method actor. That's, he's better than that. I mean. He's intense. Yeah. Intense and, and serious about it. So when I, uh, I said that, uh, saw that about him and, and knew he was a thorough professional. And he was required to grab me by the throat and push me against this this uh, wire mesh uh, wall. And I said, "Don't, uh, you know, I trust you completely. Don't, don't spare the horses. Push me." You know. I knew he did nothing harm. He's that professional. Well, I think we did it about twenty-two times. No. <laughs> wow. It was absolutely exciting. He had a, a forty-five at my face Ooh. while he was doing this, like mm -hmm. inches from, millimeters from my face. And every time we did the take and there was that gun and you looked at his face, I'm telling you, I could use a dirty line, but I won't. <laughs> That's how it made you feel. It was absolutely chilling. I would imagine he, he's in the zone. He's ready. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, an actor like that who's so dedicated to, to doing to doing it right, doing it honest, you have you can develop a lot of I have to develop a lot of trust. Yeah. And, and so so did he say I got the role in the Hulk? I want you to be in it, or how did that how did that come about? No, it uh, I don't know how it actually came about, but <clears throat> pardon me. The Hulk was being shot or part of it uh, somewhere around Southern Ontario, Toronto, and a little uh, bit of Ancaster. Um, so it's in your neck of the woods, essentially. Yeah. 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 Uh, and uh, it, it, the job came up and I got a call and great. Being in Toronto has helped you out so much. That mean, you've gotten some good roles by living in Toronto. Well, well, it's, it is the New York or LA of, uh, our country. If you, mm -hmm. yeah. Gotcha. So you're on the set and you're, can you cook pasta? Are you any good? Or pizza? Can you do <laughs> lessons in learning how to make the dough and making it fly and all the rest of it? <laughs> you have forgotten most of it, but it That's was funny. very, very intense. So, so did, did, uh, Norton was he? Did he watch you as a kid? Maybe as Spider Man, or did that conversation ever come up? Or? My, not to my knowledge. Okay. I, I I'd say, and I'm saying it because it just is what comes to mind is Norton is a one off. He, he's a force of nature. He, uh, he was thrown up by the gods uh, to be this unique, dedicated, very professional actor and a, a fascinating man. I can I can imagine why. Um, Ladies are uh, interested. He was going with Selma Hayek at the time. And on the set, set of the score, uh, he's just finished this roughish uh, scene. And lunch was called. And out of the kind of uh, bunch of actors and things it comes this uh, very short person. And Edward says, I'd like you to meet my girlfriend, uh, Selma Hayek. All right. Like a ninny, I thought, are you kidding? I didn't know he was going going with her. And she was about this high, you know. She, <laughs> absolutely she, she was Hermie size, yeah. Stunning woman. So <laughs> no well, doubt. She introduces herself. And I said, oh, sure, it's Salma Hayek. Of course you've got Salma Hayek with you. Why wouldn't you have the most gorgeous? Anyway, he still kept talking. That's so cool. Um, I think they should call you back. And at the first Avengers movie, they all ate at shawarma. I think after this oh. Avengers movie, they should all have some pizza at Stanley's, and you should cook it for the, the Avengers and get the new Spider-Man in there. Are you game for that role? All set. <laughs> You're all set for it. Sure. <laughs>
I'll leave it back just tossing the You're tossing the pie, yeah. <laughs> uh let's see. What else do we have? Um the did you happen to see the comic book recently that was that was called Spider Verse, where the Spider Man went back into your universe and teamed up with you? Did and they fought Mr. Noah Body. Did you happen to see that comic? No, I didn't. I'm sorry. But it, it it was really cool. It was. It, I heard your voice when I read it, uh, so I thought that was really cool. I have to share some images of them when they went back to uh, the 1967 universe. Um, You've got me kind of hypnotized here. You, you have this T-shirt on with a spider. I do. And, and I do a little bit of cooking and enjoy good seafood. And um, I'm seeing a lobster there. <laughs> What am I? I'm Spider Man, not Lobster Man. That would be yeah, no. <laughs> that skeleton, you know, like King Crab and all the rest of it. <laughs> so that's uh, all the questions I have for you. So let's open it up to the fans okay. for you. Um, I've got uh, a thread on our website uh, where I ask people to ask you questions. Yeah. And uh, this one is from Shy Town Spidey. He's from Chicago, Illinois. And he says, Mr. Souls, you were the one that introduced me to Spider-Man when I was four years old. Thank you. Has any of the other voice actors that portrayed Spider-Man and made series reached out to you, like Dan Gilvezan, Christopher Daniel Barnes, Josh Keaton, etc.? No, I can't say so. And I think that's largely because of geography. Uh, you know, we're, uh, we're a 12-hour train ride and a one-and-a-half-hour plane ride from New York. But it's uh, it's a fairly long distance, and uh, while most of Canadians' population, Canada's population, lives within a hundred miles of the American border, uh, we don't see each other every day. If you keep going to those comic book conventions, you're bound to run across some of them. Yes, I, I imagine. Have. Jonathan you says Nicholas Hammond, the 1970s TV show Spider-Man and Peter Parker. Nicholas you Hammond. Him. Oh, you met Nicholas Hammond. Oh, we met once. In Detroit, correct. Oh, a, he he was one of the boys in the Sound of Music. Did you did you know that? I did. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, I've I've tried to I want to get him on this show too. I think that would be fun. But you are the first, sir. So never forget that. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Alice Stair uh, doesn't put a location, but thank you, Mr. Souls. It's an honor to get to talk to you, however indirectly. Now, from the second season onward of the '67 series, Ralph. But Batch. how do you batch? There you go. Batch. Took over production along with a sharp reduction in animation animation budget. How did this affect your work as a voice actor? Uh, well, I I'm sorry to have to say, although I was aware of, of these moves and the influence uh, that Bakshi had, my interest was more in the production of the of the stories than in the crafts of the animation, the book, uh, etc. So it, it did not make any particular distinction for, uh, for us, for we who, who did the, um, the voice, uh, voicing. Um, the story was the story, the character was the character, and um, how it was done in other media was really none of our business. Shouldn't say it that way, but <laughs> it wasn't germane to our production of, of these episodes. Gotcha. Uh, Wombat909 from the United Kingdom. He has a question for you. Uh, as others have said, Mr. Souls, it's an honor to speak to you and thank you for your contribution towards Spider-Man's mythology and cultural re relevance. Thank you. Uh, when voicing Spider-Man, was, was there a particular feature of his personality you wanted to emote in your voice or one that you felt was important to be represented? Uh, I can't say that there was beyond the core, once I understood them, the, the core motivations of these characters. Why do they do what they do? You know, there's, uh, an actor has only one real obligation, and that is as close as possible to understand what the author had in mind in writing the character, writing the, the book. Uh, mm -hmm. and in this case, I mean, the book is, the lines you say, the story on paper. Uh, there is an old expression, I'm sure this gentleman and others will know, if it ain't on the page, it ain't on the stage. Uh, and so good writing is the touchstone. 
if you have good writing, you practically don't have to work at all. It, yeah. it, it will ring uh, those notes in your soul and they elicit the truth. Uh, you can't do it wrong. You can't do it wrong because it's there written right. That's right. the best de definition, if you like, of Shakespeare. Exactly. Uh, George from Texas. Hey there, Paul. I don't have a question so much as a request. My favorite Spider-Man line you did on the show was, quote, what a day, nothing to do but swing and dig it. Could you please throw that line out during the interview? Here, I can put this in the, our chat window if you want to see it. Uh, there, there's there's the line. <laughs> what a day, nothing to do but swing and dig it. What a day, nothing to do but swing and dig it. Hey. <laughs> This is, I think I'm gonna come. No, dude, that was that was that was dead on. I like it. Uh, yeah, it translated for our friends in the UK. <laughs> no, no, that George is from Texas. That the oh, UK. Is that <laughs> Wallop and web snapper. I've been in Texas. My son and I spent three months down there once. I did a play called Tally's Folly at the Dallas Theater Center. It was one of the most enjoyable times I ever had. You know there that you theater? That's it. That theater was the only theater at the Dallas Theater Center writ, uh, uh, created by uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. Wow. Genius. Who was a genius, as you know, as an architect. And this this building set in the side of a hill is it has no right angles in it whatsoever. All angles of odd shapes and sizes. Wonderful theater. That's awesome. George is actually a member of our podcast. And if you go down to Texas, he will buy you a beer. <laughs> I'll enjoy the habit. <laughs> he also says, thanks for taking time to talk Spidey with us here at the crawl space. So that's really Thank nice. Uh, we have Proto Goblin says, Mr. Souls, before getting to my question, I just wanted to say thank you. Your Spider-Man cartoon was the first one I ever watched back when YTV here in Canada Ooh. was rerunning it in the 90s with the episode Kingpin, probably the first one he ever saw. So I just wanted to ask, what led you to auditioning for the role of Spider-Man? I'm sorry, what was the, the question? What what, what uh, led you to audition for the role of Spider-Man Peter Parker? Well, again, I have to say with, with more gratitude than I can muster that I didn't, I didn't have to. Uh, this, this company was commissioned by Bernard Cowan, people he'd worked with. In, the, in this case, I have to admit I was, his first cousin, so uh, I don't think he was giving me charity or being especially uh, uh, courteous, but I'm glad to have been included in this, uh, the core uh, company, acting company that did so many of these cartoons. Again, uh, more good luck than good management. Mm -hmm. happy, happy to have been in the right place at the right time. The other, another user by the name of Wheat Cakes, uh, is also from Canada. We're, we're getting a lot of your, your neighbors in this, this question thread, Paul. Uh, yeah. He says, truly an honor to be able to take, to ask a question to the talented Paul souls. Thank you for taking the time to share it with us today. As a Canadian growing up in the seventies and the eighties, I was fortunate to get an almost daily television dose of rock and Robin hood and the wonderful stories of professor Kitzel. That's and right. I'm wondering if you have any interesting stories on your involvement and voice contributions to these programs in particular, Professor Kitzel, as it was more educational in nature. Well, indeed, um, here, here was a situation in which um, by simply by association, I was, uh, I was getting more than giving, uh, learning. It was a wonderful device for children, for information geographically, historically, et cetera. Um, and it, it, it paralleled other series, for example, with um, uh, who's the guy who uh, uh, says don't start forest fires? Um, oh, uh, Smokey the Bear. He did Smokey the Bear. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, sorry? Spirit of 76, which was the bicentennial series. Hmm. So these were projects I got more out of than maybe gave because I was learning. It was, it was you know, you, it, literally getting paid to go to school. That's wonderful. 
That's awesome. Wheat Cake says, Wallop and Web Snapper is all the best, Mr. Souls. So that's nice. Wheat Cake's right back at you. Thank you. <laughs> Aziz, Wallop and Web Snappers is his opening line. <laughs> uh, he, he's assuming you did Bruce Banner, so we're going to fix that. But Peter Parker in the 60s and made an appearance in the... Any plans on appearing in the Marvel Cinematic Universe Spider-Man sequel? The, uh, the, the, uh, the latest one with Tom Holland. If they call you up, they say they want you in there. Are you going? Absolutely. But I've got to say, I can remember almost like it was yesterday. My God, it was yesterday. No, uh, <laughs> not that many years ago, 10 or 12. I know I was in Stratford at the time. Stratford is the site of the best Shakespearean theater in North America. Uh, about two hours from Toronto, midway between Toronto and Detroit. And it was an honor to be able to play there. Uh, I, I brought this up for a reason. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, about 12 years ago. Uh, uh, your question had, I'm 87, remember? Help me out here. Yeah. The, 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 oh, yeah. Uh, at that time, the first of the feature films uh, of Spider-Man came along. It was the second one. There was talk at the time here in the city. I remember Jonathan took me back, great big billboard, outdoor billboard advertising a film. Uh, the next the next one they were gonna make, mm -hmm. possibility that I might be invited to do a little cameo. That's it's cool. Not, unfortunately. But I'm always ready. I'm in the phone book. I have an agent and I yeah. can still and I think it would have been cool to have you and Stan Lee in the Stan Lee's pizza shop in the Hulk. I think that like you would have been brothers because you could pass for brothers. I think that would look, that would be neat. Not, we're not all that on, uh, on the light. Right. Yeah. I wish I had his energy. <laughs> but anyway, that would have been cool. That, that would be great fun. That would be really neat. Um, all right. We're going to, that's all the message board questions. Let's turn to YouTube. There's a little bit of a delay once I ask the YouTubers to start asking questions. Uh, so go over to our chat window, YouTubers, and we will take live questions uh, for Paul. And then we'll wrap it up pretty much, Paul. Paul, you've been d telling some great stories, by the way. I'm loving it. I'm glad I can remember them. <laughs> Do you have any, while, while we're waiting for the YouTubers, do you have any like spider collectibles? I mean, do you still pick up the comics or? Uh... I do what my son does. God love him. Yeah. You've got, for example, in behind you there, I'm pointing at a. Head. Yeah, I've got a ton of Spider Man stuff. It looked like, it looks like the mug. Jonathan got a couple of mugs and we take uh -huh. them off to the Comic Cons. In fact, I'd run out if you'd let me and, and get it. Oh, you can oh. if you want. While we're waiting on the YouTubers, it's fine. Wait a sure. I'd, I'd love to see what Spider-Man's voice has as collectibles for Spider-Man. I think that's kind of cool. And also, YouTubers. All right. Here, here comes a couple questions already. We're, we've got uh, 15 people watching us at the moment on our YouTube live stream. So Warrior Herb and Enigma, we're going to get your questions in just a second as uh, Paul comes back. Oh, there we go. Here we go. What do we got? Oh, that's so cool. I like that. Do you drink coffee out of that, or is it? it is it? I do. It's clean now. Would you like some? Feel free. Well, you know, I should have, I should have brought my Spider-Man glass in here, but I got <laughs> this. Is not cool. I got a Captain America cup that I'm drinking out of. That, That's all that, right. <laughs> we're working for the same team. <laughs> That's true. Uh, while you were gone, we've got two people that ask questions in the YouTube chat. We've got Warrior Herb. Herb on the weekends is a warrior, evidently. <laughs> Paul, yours is the only voice I hear as Peter and Spider-Man whenever I read a Spider-Man comic book. Oh, Your voice talent is an honor. Would you ever make it up to Alberta, Canada for a comic book convention? Sure. And I've spent many, many, many enjoyable times in Alberta. In right. fact, at one of, one of the early stampedes where uh, a former uh, college <clears throat> colleague of mine uh, owned a parking lot near the Calgary Stampede grounds. I don't know if you know about the Calgary Stampede. I don't. It's one of the big, biggest rodeos in the world. Okay. Uh, and it's huge, truly huge. <clears throat> and he bought this parking lot, became a very wealthy and prominent realtor 
in uh, in Calgary, and he has several daughters who sang with a wonderful musical and dancing group called the, the Young Canadians. And um, he would get out there every year with his daughters, a little change purse around his waist, and he, he and the girls would park cars for the Calgary Stampede. I mean, he was a millionaire, but he yeah. didn't mind getting out there and, and working hard. Jerry Knowlton, I've always uh, uh, remembered him, and the sense of purpose he gave his girls. It was terrific. That's cool. Ready uh, to come out to Calgary at any time. Had many, many, many. many things how far away is uh, Calgary from Toronto? Is it, is uh, good, well, if you walk, drive? quite a while. Okay. Quite a, no, Calgary is uh, three and a half hours by air. Three hours by air. There you go. Yeah. You need to have that convention pe- get you a plane ticket. Sure. I used to own an airplane. Uh, my son and I have flown across the country in in it, uh, and um, I had some wonderful adventures in or near Calgary, including landing on the Sarsi Indian Reserve, just south of town, wow. near Cochrane, where the leader of the, the uh, tribe and owner of the property came running out on a horse and said, you, you can't be here, this is Indian land. Um, but he let me stay, provided soup. Oh, that's cool. Me, all the rest of it. Uh, Rupert Crowchild. So wow. Calgary has always been um, uh, very dear to me. Yeah. Enigma uh, says, are you technically the first man to ever voice Spider-Man? I think you are. I think so. Uh, I don't recall any other media. No, the, the, car- the cartoon was the first as far as I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what what is it like to be the first? I mean, is there? Uh... Uh, <laughs> I, I I can only say truly grateful because, uh, as they say, you only get one chance to make a first impression. Exactly, and, and, and you made a heck of a first impression. We're still I'll, talking. I'll, about I'll be absolutely honest with you. I know my my son will corrupt, corroborated that I'm feeling. I spoke partly guilty because. I didn't have to do that much to get it or to enjoy it. But the fact of the matter is, I, 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 I don't understand how I got lucky to be in a position to set this, um, what's the right word, style in, in such a way that people remember it. I can only say that the reason they do is because it was well written, well animated. The stories were rock solid. Um, the villains were imaginative and unusual, and it's nice to be there first in line to make that impression and have people remember it. And I can only be right. nothing but grateful. And do you have a, a list of uh, what favorite Spider-Man films you have? I mean, do you is there one that uh, stands out better than the other ones? No, I've not no. seen all. Oh, you haven't. It's a matter of trying to afford the price of the admission. <laughs> but, uh, no, no. Um, they, should, they, they should have you come out to the premiere with Stan. I think that'd be perfect. I wouldn't say no. <laughs> As I say, my, my numbers in the phone book, and uh, uh, I'm available. Exactly. Oh, we just had uh, Sam Kirby. Uh, jump on the YouTube. Sam, you think I have a lot of stuff. Sam Kirby has one of the largest Spider-Man collections of all time. And his wife still puts up with him. <laughs> but uh, he's uh, uh, Sam says, Paul, great to listen to you. You're still the voice I hear when reading Spider-Man. Thanks for your contribution to Spider-Man lore. So, Kids, kids do you see what fun you can have if you learn to read? <laughs> Do you do you have anybody that when you read something that is in your like their voice acting is so strong you can't not hear them? Do you have anybody like that? Because you're for us no, Spider Man fans, you are it a lot of the well, time. Well, uh, again, because I was there first or whatever, <clears throat> but it's true. I don't think you know when you read a book, a story, whatever it is. When you read, you actually are unconsciously making the sound of that dialogue in your your mind, even though nothing is being said or any voice 
tone being done. You automatically do it. So when you read somebody's dialogue, you actually are hearing them talk. Mm -hmm. So if what I have done matches or gets close to what you kind of, what your imagination or mind creates, then I'm grateful. That's awesome. Well, you, you nailed it for so many Spider-Man fans, myself included. Um, Matt Bird wants to know uh, if you're in touch with any of your co-stars from that, the cartoon still. I know well, some have passed away. Yes. Uh, and it's right to acknowledge who are still with us. Uh, um, Billy May is gone, unfortunately. Uh, maybe Peg is I think, still alive. Um, uh, uh, oh, I can see her. It was it was uh, uh, who's mom? Um, Corinne Corinne Connolly uh -huh. is still uh, still with us. Um, uh, uh, Gary Tall did the the original um, foreman of the elves. Carl uh -huh. Banas B A N A S is uh -huh. still with us. Alfie Scott, who played. The Charlie, the the uh, the uh, Charlie, Charlie in the box, and the oh island. yeah yeah the the Jack in the box yeah Jack yeah Ch yeah. Charlie in the box, not Jack in the box. oh I'm sorry not Jack that's his brother <laughs> Charlie in the box it yeah. was the island of misfit toys exactly <laughs> anyway Alf is still around well on in years these are the ones that are still around but and myself. But, uh that's from rudolph as far as spidey is concerned um gee not not many of the originals are, are still around you uh um we talked about how on that saturday that uh spider-man premiered on abc you didn't uh gather around the television to watch however do you still gather around the television every year to see rudolph i mean you're still on the air 50 years later after that show every year in primetime CBS. I have to tell you, there hasn't been a, many years that I haven't. <clears throat> and I'm still surprised at the connection it makes. You may also want to know, if you don't, that at Christmas time, there is a live action stage show musical. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! All the artifacts from the stop motion puppetry uh, show mm -hmm. extremely faithful to the original, and kids go there by the thousands. You know, three, four, five, six, seven years uh, of age, and it's a real treat. Uh, there are at least two, maybe three companies that travel in the United States and Canada at Christmas time and do this show so look for one uh, at a theater near you the the uh, they also did a uh, in new york they did a theater production of spider-man where people are getting hurt left and right did you I see thought, that one by a chance I see it. no but i heard uh, yeah read about the, you know, some, some that one of, wasn't as faithful yeah. to the source material <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. uh enigma i think will be our last question uh what were your influences when voicing the character did you have any for spider-man I'd like to be able to tell you that um, uh, the names of all the people <clears throat> when I was growing up in the 40s, 50s, 60s, listening to the great uh, not only soap operas, but uh, dramatic series that are uh, in prime time. And everybody from Orson Welles down, you know, he had an acting company, Mercury Theater, uh, that I believe Mr. Peck. Glenn Beck uh, uh, named his company after it, but his company was, um, oh, what am I trying to say? Um, Your acting company? John, help me here. Uh, Orson, uh, Orson Welles acting, Mercury Theater. Mercury Theater. Hmm, okay. Uh, and in it, uh, there were several of the people who he used in movies um citizen kane etc and he was looked on as the great <coughs> uh voice there there was a there isn't or wasn't i think he's still alive i don't know an american actor named alexander scurby s-c-o-u-r-b-y 
distinguished, mm -hmm. elegant, classical, magnificent voice. Right. So these were, if you like, the inspiration for uh, for us, as well as both from stage, TV, and movies of the English uh, stage, Gilgo, uh, Olivier, um, et cetera, et cetera. You, you've named your inspirations, and we're, we're saying you're our inspiration. So do you have any ad advice for future actors or voice actors of how to have the longevity or how to get the job and, and still be well, loved? I can tell you, because at the last Comic-Con we were at, a young gentleman by the name of David Kay came and joined the um, the presentations there. We had dinner with him on our last night. And he's originally a Canadian and doing extremely well in Los Angeles and New York. Uh, I don't know that I can tell you what particular things he's done, but he's, if you like, the incarnation of what I'd like ideally uh, to have been able to do as a young man, hardly middle age, maybe in his 50s, early 50s. But to have that opportunity to be, as with any theatrical event, that the writing is so good and available, to be the instrument to deliver it, gives you a sense of enormous satisfaction, feeling of usefulness, and uh, it builds the ego, let me tell you. And oh, yeah. To get your hands or your voice around some of the greatest writing of all time, is uh, is an honor, and it. I'm still. I get chills now thinking about some of the the good stuff I've uh, I've had the opportunity to do. Talk a bit about um, any any projects coming up. I know I just visited your website wallopinwebsnappers.com, which is great. It really gives a good history of this show, and you 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 doing the narration of it is awesome too. Well, that is much largely due to uh, Jonathan's uh, efforts. Your, your son, yeah, in uh, early two thousands. Uh, that it got done at all, and um, he continues to want to perpetuate the music tracks. Oh yeah, they're they're awesome. Well, we'll see if anything comes of that. But he's been uh, wonderfully interest, interested and creative, and I hope uh, his ideas come to a little greater fruition. Any comic book conventions or any uh, jobs coming up in the future that we need to look for you? I don't know. I mean, that'll depend on my. I'm at the point where my mother was, God love her. <clears throat> Most of her time was spent going to doctors mm -hmm. at my age. You know, things don't last forever. You'd like to think they do, but they don't. Well, I think the so, show proves that this is going to last forever. Your, your well, work that's fine. is but living I'm, on forever. In terms of the yes. future, uh, there, there was talk of going to uh, a Comic Con in uh, Connecticut in August. I uh, don't know about that yet. It'll depend, as they say, on the doctors. Um, uh, also, I did the second season of a show called My 90-Year-Old Roommate. This is done entirely for the web. The oh, yeah. Second season is done. We'll be airing at the end of uh, April, May. Don't know about a third season yet. I'll have to watch that. I haven't heard of that. That sounds cool. Well, it's at the moment, it's CBC that is uh, financed and is releasing it, but uh, it's a cute premise created by a young man who, who is the, who I play is his 90 year old roommate. He moves in with me. It's an interesting, odd couple sort of, um, yeah. Uh, and a little bit, uh, tart and a little bit, uh, salty language, uh, more than I was ever used to, but I, I would like to hear the voice of Spider-Man cuss. I think that would yeah, be fun. <laughs> it's, it's a lot like, the character I'm playing is a lot like what Larry David would do. Hmm. So it's there that kind of uh, dynamic. Well, uh, Paul, before we go, if you don't mind, um, I was going to record, put this at the very front when I get the audio going. I'm going to put this in the chat window so you can see it. Would you mind saying that? It's, it's a little intro to this episode when I edit the audio. Yeah, I can try. Okay. It's a little far away here. Or... Er it's not, I'll, I'll, I'll just do it. I won't be able to look. Okay. The camera because oh, it's, it's fine. It's fine. This is audio anyway. So my memory, it's audio only. It's audio only. Okay. Yeah, so, so yeah. This is Paul Souls, the original voice actor of Spider Man. And you're listening to the Spider Man Crawl Space podcast 500th episode.
wallop and web snappers. My spidey sense is tingling. I, that was a perfect read. I, I'm not going to make you do more than one take. That was so good. Paul, Listen, Jonathan, thank you so much for taking the time. I'm really honored by, by talking can, to you too. Thank you for the invitation. This is, uh, it is fun to reminisce. Uh, good times. You bet. No doubt. And if you ever get in the Midwest near Missouri in the United States, I hope to meet you in person. I look forward to it. All right. Okay. I think we're done. Jonathan, uh, thank you also uh, for making this happen. I was a little worried yesterday that uh, it wouldn't happen. So there you are. There's a son. Thank he, you, Jonathan. Uh, he kept it afloat, my boy. I'm I'm not, uh, you know, a, a courant with the current technology. But he is. Some Sometimes with the internet, a duct tape and a prayer will work, you know? <laughs> All right, gentlemen, I will let you have uh, enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Paul and Jonathan, thank you so much. Gentlemen. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks, Brad. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.